Welcome one and all to another episode of the Religious Studies Project. As I'm sure you know by now, I'm David Robertson. And I'm Chris Carter, and we are coming to you from the Lothians today. Yes, we're we're once again connecting across the interwebs. Um, me in my pokey office, Chris in his slightly more palatial living room. But <laughs> we've been, if as we've said, you you know our voices, and you probably also know Tommy Coleman, Thomas J. Coleman the third, I should say, who's been our managing editor for. A number of years now and is really the uh the how would you describe we always say he's the spider in the middle of the web that is the religious studies project but i like to think he's he's more like hodor holding the door back there's a topical reference for you anyway, that will work yeah any, anyway he's talking about non-religion as he often is um and this time he's talking to david speed and the title is non-religion religion public health Let's find out. Thank you for joining us today on the Religious Studies Project. I'm uh, Thomas Coleman, and I uh, have an interesting topic that I, I don't believe we've we've broached before on uh, non-religion and public health. And I uh, have a special guest with us today to talk about this, but uh, kind of wanted to provide uh, the listeners with a, with a little bit of background first before we introduce him. So. Uh, the, the link between religion and, uh, and public health is, is really a recurring theme in the empirical literature uh, within psychology of religion, public health, medical studies, and, and other disciplines. Uh, th- this research is often limited to correlational studies because the procedures required to test these links experimentally are, are either unfeasible or raise serious ethical considerations. For example, um, uh, as, as psychologists, it's really hard for us to figure out how we could validly manipulate someone's non-religious or religious identification, their beliefs, or, or their behavior in a laboratory setting. And university ethics uh, committees uh, have a problem uh, with us kind of assigning people to the cancer condition for an experiment. So um, we can't do that. But when many of these uh, aforementioned correlational studies, some of which we'll talk about in a second, uh, identify a relationship between religion and improve health, religion is often interpreted to be an important causal factor. And uh, in today's podcast, I am pleased to have with us uh, Dr. David Speed, who is an and an assistant professor at the University of New Brunswick, uh, and his own research has applied a critical perspective to the religion and health literature, specifically focusing on how the non-religious have comparable health to the religious. David, welcome to the Religious Studies Project. Hi, Tommy. Thanks for having me. Excellent, excellent. So, um, you know, I was hoping we could have a, a little discussion along the lines of religion, non-religion, kind of at the intersection on uh, on public health more generally, but 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 also from the perspective of just psychological and and, and an individual's health. Um, sure. And and I know um, j- just pointing out kind of some further relevance for the listeners here um, in the U.S. Uh, I think the Department of Defense uh, has a multi-million dollar initiative looking at spiritual fitness training and and screening of troops, and and I, I can I can see David grimacing right now, um, but you know th- this underscores an important fact that many governments and public health researchers are not simply interested in understanding or or studying the the relationships between religion and health but actually using the purported benefits of religion and spirituality to shape public policy um, and then a last example here I'm, I'm reminded because uh, I've been living in the UK kind of off and on for the past two years uh, of the United Kingdom uh, has uh, recently funded a mindfulness meditation interventions and I think over 200 countywide schools so I'm I, I'm excited to to get down to a critical discussion about kind of the nature of religion and health with you David and, and see uh, see where it goes. It sounds wonderful. Where to, so where where does some of your own research uh, kind of fit in at the nexus between religion, non-religion, and, and 
personal health health in general? Uh, so I guess it uh, stems from my dissertation. I started uh, my PhD in 2011. I graduated in 2015. And uh, when I got accepted into my PhD program, I was told by my advisor I'd have to pick a health-related topic. And like a lot of grad students, I didn't really know initially what to study. I knew I wanted a PhD, wasn't sure what I wanted to study. And essentially, I kind of got to the point where I was considering like, well, what if I could study anything, what do you want to study? And I had a pre-existing interest in uh, atheism and in religion. And so I was like, well, I wonder how those things relate to health. And so, you know, you go to the literature, like as one does. And I immediately found like literally hundreds of thousands of citations or references to various religion and health topics. And I thought, well, okay, well, obviously someone's been very busy because uh, this is my first real exposure to it. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm curious how atheism fits in with this. And I found, I think, fewer than, I don't know, maybe a dozen papers, two dozen papers addressing atheism and health. So right away I knew that, you know, uh, they're obviously just on a numbers game alone. There's Atheism and health is understudied. So I was curious about how atheism fit within the religion and health paradigm. And I started going through the literature. and over and over again, you see this recurring set of findings, as you alluded to uh, in your intro, that religion equals better health. Religion equals better health. Uh, so, you know, going to church is good. Being religious is good. Prayer is good. Meditation is good. Spirituality is good. Religious affiliation is good. Belief in God is good. Yada, yada, yada. Can, so, was sorry. Say, could, could you give us a few examples there, though? Because I do, it was kind of very general about that, um, w- where these relationships appear. Sure. So uh, if you're looking at, say, uh, like church-based studies, uh, you'll find that uh, religious congregants who attend church more frequently are more likely to report, say, lower levels of depression. Uh, they might report better perceived well-being. Uh, if you're looking at national studies, you might find that uh, people with higher levels of church attendance report uh, better happiness. Uh, there's it varies from country to country. Uh, there's a there's a cultural effect that happens. But a lot of the positive literature uh, really centers around the U.S., where uh, religion tends to be more dominant. Uh, there's a smaller portion for Canada and the U.K. and other areas. Uh, but generally, um, a lot of these studies just kind of recurrently suggest that, you know, if you go to church then or if you're religious, you might be more likely to go for screening behaviors uh, for cancers. Uh, if you're religious, you are more likely to feel empowered. Uh, if you are religious or if you believe in God, you're more likely to be comfortable uh, in like, you know, a situation where you have to face your own own mortality, something like that. And, and so you're kind of reviewing the literature here as you're doing your doctoral studies and, and yeah. you, you uncover this stuff. And uh, and what happens? Where? What <laughs> what has happened since then? Now, you know, what what did that what did that prompt you to test, do, or or dig in deeper? So as I'm going through the literature, uh, there's there's a few things that like I start noticing, like kind of like simultaneously. Uh, and what it was is like you know you read a few papers and you say like okay well okay yeah, people are saying going to church is good okay that's fine whatever and that's they're just they're generalizing by accident but whatever so you go through a few more and you're like wait a minute wait a minute so um, a lot of the studies not all the studies but a good chunk of the studies uh, they recruit from exclusively religious samples so they'll go to different church locations they'll ask congregants who are there how often you go to church how happy are you. Uh, and they'll, they'll form a correlational relationship between these uh, two ideas. You now, correlational research, it's not bad. Uh, you, it's difficult to make a causal argument with correlational data, uh, but you can point to associations that are recurring. But if you are using an exclusively religious population in order to test something, you can't generalize the benefits of whatever they're doing to everyone because not everyone's part of that exclusive religious population. Right. So if you find that, you know, if you sample like five Methodist churches in, you know, the Midwest, uh, you can't then say, well, everyone should go to church because of this mm-hmm. sample. You'd have to say, well, people who go to Methodist churches more frequently or congregants, they report better well-being. Like that's, that's a fair conclusion. Mm-hmm. Now, often the literature would say this in like kind of an ex- in a roundabout way, but they would often talk more broadly about the benefits of going to church or the benefits of being religious or prayer or whatever. Uh, the other issue, too, is a lot of the research uh, that is like large scale, it's looking at uh, it's looking at outcomes that are kind of intrinsically related to uh, going to church frequently. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the classic one in this is just it's selecting on the dependent variable and self-rated health is one of the big 
benefits of being uh, or being religious or of scoring higher on measures of religion and spirituality or RS. So uh, what researchers will do is they'll go into, say, a religious organization and they'll say, how often do you go to church? How healthy do you think you are? Or do you have any health issues? They find that people who go to church more frequently report better perceived health and fewer health issues. Well, yeah, obviously, because people who are really ill or people who have recurring health issues can't get out and go to church frequently. Right. That's that's not shocking. It's kind of pointing out that, uh, I don't know, people who are going through some sort of medical treatment uh, are somehow you know, less healthy than people who don't have to do that. Mm. Well, obviously, they're going for medical treatment because of the way they are, not because of some factor right. that's driving the magic of that medical treatment. So this this is the other, this is a separate issue altogether, is that if you're selecting on the dependent variable, what essentially you're going to do is you're, you're limiting people who may be on the lower end of that health mm. who would love to go to church more frequently but can't. Um, another issue with it, uh, sorry, I'm just rattling off a bunch no, of per- issues because perfect. this is my, this is my life. Um, another one of the issues is that there's, there was often a conflation of low religiosity with secularism. Right. So it's the idea if you get really low levels of religiosity. So like, oh, I'm not religious. I don't go to church. I don't really pray. The implicit conclusion or sometimes explicit conclusion of the researchers who do that type of research would say, oh, these people embody secularism. Mm -hmm. That is not an equivalent statement. Uh, The issue with that is secularism is, is adhering or taking specific positions on other topics. Right. It's not merely the, you know, being apathetic towards religion Mm -hmm. It's having endorsing other specific values that are more secular in nature. So there is this conflation of low religiosity with secularism. So researchers would report, you know, religion's healthier than secularism, but they're not assessing secularism the vast majority of the time. They're just equating low secularism or high secularism with low religiosity. And and, or we might say more specifically, just kind of secular or non-religious people, per se, because we're 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 used to on the religious studies project, of course, taking a very critical uh, uh, approach to these terms, something we, sure. we don't usually do in, in psych sure. of religion, although we should more. So <laughs> just kind of giving that uh, to our listeners is, is a blanket term um, here, you know, c- confusing people who would probably identify as self-identify as secular or non-religious with yes. actually religious pe- people who would identify as religious. Yes, absolutely. Um, the biggest issue, though, for the uh, for the research, though, is that there are the mechanism driving the relationship between religion and health isn't always clear. Uh, the big one that has the most support, I would argue, is social support. And, so and not, I was going to see if what do you mean by mechanism here uh, so, in terms of driving? How, how would how does that work? Sure. So if you say that, like Advil. Uh, is related to pain reduction, right? Advil's doing something, or I don't know, ibuprofen if we want to be non-brand specific. Ibuprofen is acting on your body in some biological way in order to produce the desired outcome. If the argument is that religion is connected with health, well, how is it connected with health? Like We can point at an association that high religion, high health, but why is that? What's the driving mechanism underpinning that relationship? And the the Arguably, the strongest contender for that, uh, from what I can see, is social support. And social support is associated with health. Uh, social support is uh, your perceived the perceived availability of resources around you from people. So if I'm crying, can I call my friend and will he or she console me? If I need money for rent until like next week, will my friend have my back? Uh, if I really want to share about my day, will my wife humor me and listen to me talk about research for the 35th time that week? Yeah, so stuff like that. That's social support. So generally, uh, the more available social support a person has or the higher degree of availability, the healthier they are. And this isn't shocking. Like having friends around you, having family and peers who you can rely on, that's associated with good health. Um, Religion's associated with health. This is true. But social support is also associated with religion. So people who are religious tend to report higher levels of social support. And to me, this makes a lot of sense. Like it would be astounding if you went to... uh, church on a weekly basis or mosque on a weekly basis or synagogue on a weekly basis. And there was no social benefit to it. Mm. It would be astounding if that were the case. So the problem is because the three of these things are interrelated, when you're talking about social support 
uh, when you're talking about religion benefiting health, a question that's really important for researchers is why. And if it's social support, it's it gets more dicey about how we're interpreting this then. Social support is a general benefit of social activities. It's not a specific benefit of religion and spirituality. I was just... So well, it was just going to get to asking that, you know, aren't there aren't there some arguments that maybe religion is is, is not the only source, but but people might argue a, a very good source of creating the, the the social connections. How does that kind of bode here? That no, it's it's not religion per se, but it is it, it's it's a really big driver of social connectedness sure and i i think i think that's a very reasonable position to take uh my about half of my family is i would describe quite religious uh they tend to they go to church frequently they tend to really enjoy church but often they're talking about you know so this happened at church or so and so this said this i really liked engaging with this person and it would be like i think it's a fantastic way of socializing with like-minded people i think it's wonderful the problem is is that the way this is presented within findings and the way you often see just of for religious oriented policy, mm-hmm. uh, say in like from government or from specific initiatives looking at improving spirituality and the fighting men and women of the United States, mm-hmm. is that you might see this as uh, saying, oh, well, religion is doing this. It's not re- religion or uh, social support via religion, it's just religion. Uh, so last year, I had wrote a paper about this uh, where, we're dis- uh, where I was discussing that. Uh, it's very frustrating talking about the benefits of religion when social support seems to be playing a major role in this. Yeah. So uh, if you don't mind, I was going to take an excerpt from that uh, paper to kind of help illustrate that. No, absolutely. I, I said, for example, it is not difficult to imagine that persons who are active in chess clubs will have access to social support from their fellow members. Furthermore, it is not unreasonable to imagine that more active members of chess clubs would report better access to social support than less active members. However, if it were found that attendance at chess clubs was positively related to mammography, it would be unusual for a researcher to frame these findings as chess enthusiasm promotes breast x-rays. However, or instead, it would be likely argued that social support, which is accessible from any number of institutions, including chess clubs, was responsible for increased screening behavior. However, in much of the existing religion health literature, a general benefit of social support, better screening in this case, mm-hmm. appears to be presented as a specific benefit of religious activities. And this is this is what I find very frustrating as a researcher is that it would be shocking if going to church every mm-hmm. week didn't do something. But the, the important thing there is the social activity for it uh, and not necessarily the religious angle for it. In fact, there's several studies where when they're controlling for social support mm-hmm. in the relationship between religion and health, that relation, the religion health relationship goes to nothing uh, because they're controlling for social support. This doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. It, it happens in several studies. Mm-hmm. And this is an important thing to consider. And finally, I had one more point. I had one more point mm-hmm. about things that I found frustrating about the literature um, is that even when researchers, when they weren't looking at exclusively religious samples, mm-hmm. they were uh, and they used general samples, right? Mm-hmm. What they would do is they would describe everybody's relationship between religion and health with a single uh, type of consideration. So everyone got the same description of that relationship. So there was no real strong interest in looking at whether or not uh, the relationship between religion and health uh, was affected by other factors. Mm-hmm. Now, researchers have tested moderation before. Uh, they find that, say, uh, less educated people tend to find uh, like a stronger benefit from mm-hmm. uh, religion and health. Right. Um, so we're talking about we're, we're talking here about mo- moderating factors being like yeah. level of education. Maybe it only holds for lower, or higher, or income, yeah. for example, or or men versus women kind of. Thing. Yes. So, so, a, so I guess adding nuance to this religion is good for you. Yes. Uh, but the cool, well, not the cool thing. The frustrating thing is that um, when you're looking at general samples, you're sampling people who are not religious. You're sampling people who are not uh, spiritual. You're sampling people who are atheist, right? And there's no reason to suspect that these people would value uh, religion, spirituality, to the same extent as someone who believes in God or is religious or is spiritual. There's no, there should be no default assumption that these groups are equivalent to begin with. Um, if you're looking at, say, sex-based differences, like men versus women or males versus females, um, you could say, well, there's no reason to suspect that one of these people would have a radically different relationship with religion. Like, they're not 
their identity or their moderating factor there isn't a religiously selected variable. If you're looking at people who are atheists, though, that is something related to uh, the very idea of religion and spirituality. If you're looking at non-religion, that's something that's very much so related to the idea intrinsically to religion and spirituality. But what had happened is these previous studies, they all treated, uh, they treated everyone uh, in the entire samples having more or less the same expressed relationship between religion and health. So they looked at like, sex is a moderating factor or age is a moderating factor or education, but there was generally never any interest in looking at people who are non-religious, whether or not they reported an equivalent relationship. Right. So what the focus of my doctoral work was on was looking at the idea of health outcomes and religious and spiritual beliefs and behaviors, but looking at whether or not people who were atheists or non-religious or non-spiritual, whether or not they reported a different linear relationship between those activities or beliefs and outcomes. And it turns out, Quite often they did, and quite often they reported a far, uh, like a lower health score when they reported higher levels of religion and spirituality. So if you go to church, that's fine, but you would, in this case, like, you know, if you would have to be religious really to see that same relationship. Mm -hmm. If you're not religious and you're attending uh, church all the time, this is different health implications. So problematically, if you're saying, you know, there's, there's a monolithic relationship between religion and health, you're losing a lot of nuance there because uh, religion and spirituality has benefits, but you have to be, have a religious and spiritual identity, right. which is conducive to you benefiting from those activities. So I joke and say, well, like my doctoral work, I, I got a PhD for saying religion's healthy, but you got to be religious to get mm -hmm. that benefit. Yeah. Uh, and so it's it's kind of a simplification, but no one had looked at that previously. Yeah. No, and, and uh, to add to this here, I, I think it's these are really important nuances, um, particularly again in domain of, of public policy and uh, and public health. Um, for example, um, I'm, I'm thankful to have been a part of some of the, they have different workshops, uh, put on by different places that have like week long, uh, courses for private healthcare providers, government officials, and, and so on, uh, specifically informing them about the research on the relationship between religion, spirituality, and, and health. And, and, and the takeaway from, these I, they're, they're conducted very well, but there's also at the same time a certain level of nuance that is that is just missing. And and the takeaway message I I, I hear when I'm in some of these presentations or or venues or or even reading um, uh, books and chapters on religion, and public health is this kind of assumption that that since we now know the, the we, we've we've identified uh, kind of the circumscribe the, the positive effects of religion here well then now, now that now that we found the fountain of youth let's drink from it and and, and, and there, there, there's there's almost this yeah there it's not direct um and i've been very impressed in some of the more recent literature that has been taking into consideration non-religious concerns or saying you know we don't know here but typically it seems like there's a blanket message that uh, you know, r religion is, is good for a host of things, and and we we should use this. Uh, the government can can grab a hold of this, and and you're saying that, uh, kind of possibly, but <laughs> yeah, um, shockingly, there's more nuance to this than religion equals good health, because um, one of the things that really sticks out uh, from the religion health literature is when you look at people who are atheists, right? Atheists generally, uh, they don't have to, uh, we were discussing this prior to the show beginning, atheists generally aren't religious, they generally don't go to church, they generally don't score highly on religiosity measures, atheists have really comparable health to believers. Mm -hmm. So if you, like just logically, if you expect that high religiosity equals better health, and low religiosity should equal worse health, mm -hmm. Atheists should be fairly unhealthy on average, just on that sort of like kind of simplistic, right. somewhat reductionist perspective. But it's not. It's it's somewhat paradoxical. Um, my uh, colleague and I, uh, Karen Wong, uh, we published a paper called The Healthy Heretic Paradox, uh, in which we looked at atheists who... Uh, on like measures of uh, health using nationally representative data from America. And we find that on average, they tended to report comparable health to theists who were strong believers, uh, despite the fact that they didn't believe in God at all. So this, this shows there's something of a fly in the ointment because if religion just uniformly benefits health, well, people who are really not religious, like mm -hmm. atheists, 
or the non polling Well, let's say atheists, just kind of the more extreme example. Uh, you wouldn't really expect them to be healthy, but they are, meaning that the description it looks at the very face value of it, that there's something very wrong with how that uh, relationship is being summarized. No. And, uh, uh, I, I think it, uh, I'm having a brain fart. We, 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 we will edit, we'll edit the short, the, the short transition period out. Um, 24 minutes. So there's something, there's something fishy with the way that the relationship is interpreted both uh, at the academic level and certainly bubbles up to, to, to policy and, and other things. Um, what, what other studies have you, uh, have you conducted that, that speak to this, say, uh, lack of a nuance, um, that, that was, that was previously in, in the, in the literature? Um, um for this and 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 also i i guess it would be uh it, it would be strange to see uh i i can only think what uh you know the president of the u.s or or, or different administrations uh what kind of flack they would take if they decided uh you know to prescribe kind of atheism uh because it seemed that people who you know believe did not believe in god more strongly um had comparable health to the religious. So I, I was just kind of interested in, in what, other, what other research and work you, you've conducted that can speak to this interesting, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a hydraulic relationship, maybe? Yeah. Um, geez. Uh, in regards to the political thing, I'm not sure if I feel comfortable answering no. whether or not the government should prescribe uh, religious or uh, theistic beliefs. I certainly wouldn't feel comfortable with the government doing that, regardless of whether or not they prescribe atheism or theism. Um, as to the research, uh, so what I generally do, um, what I, uh, my research, it uses uh, pre-existing data sets uh, from Statistics Canada, from the General Social Survey out of the University of Chicago. I think it's the National Opinion Research Council. I think they do the uh, they do the studies. Anyway, so this data is publicly available to any researcher they, who is interested in doing it and has the uh, competence and statistics to do the assessment. But I've published, oh a little more than half a dozen studies on the topic between religion and health. In each case, I'm looking at, okay, well, let's let's look at how this actually relates, and let's try and distinguish between people who are believe versus not believe in terms of these outcomes. Uh, and in virtually all cases I found is that um, often when there's a really strong positive relationship between religion and health, say for believers, you would find a moderating effect for whether or not someone was an atheist. Uh, I published a study with... Uh, the Journal of Religion and Health uh, in 2016 or 17, I can't remember now, but it was looking at data from Ontario, which is a large, the largest province population-wise in Canada, and it found that people who uh, go to church, they tend to report uh, better health, but, or I think it was uh, satisfaction with life, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're looking at the non-religious people reporting the same level of attendance, then what you see is a very different relationship. It actually reports a negative relationship. Now, this isn't to mean that, like, going to church is bad. Right. It's just you, you need more nuance when you're discussing. Um, you need more nuance when you're discussing these things, especially at a public policy level, uh, because it's not this panacea that fixes everything. So it seems like there's there's a heavy interpretation factor here where on on one end we, we you know the, the general trend might be to say oh, l l look at the positive effects of for, you know to use the re recurring example you know uh, church attendance uh yeah. here but then you know we would we would not want to conclude for example that uh i don't know less religious or non-religious people uh sh should avoid church like the plague because it no. it, it, no. it it apparently uh you know, has a harmful impact on on their health. What what we're talking about here is not necessarily, I, I, I guess, a causal relationship. No, no. Uh, I think if you made like a group of non-believers go to church, I mean, like besides the ethical issues yeah. with that, I don't 
think I, I, I wouldn't immediately suspect that like all of them would be miserable and report like, no. you know, increases in depression or whatever. Um, but the problem is with when you're looking at how the academic findings are used and discussed in the broader social lens, how they're used to inform public policy or the potential they have to increase uh, policy or to influence policy. Yeah. There's some discussion about including uh, like, me, like, uh, you know, default assuming that you should discuss religion and spirituality in clinical therapy. Uh, so that like, that's there, there's a real world consequence to this type of finding. Uh, and the problem is, is that if you're looking at these relationships and you're just trying to treat it as, or you're mentally treating it as more religion, better health, right. you're losing a lot of the nuance. You're losing the sight of the personal idea that, you know, perhaps some people aren't religious because they really are opposed to religion and forcing them to address those topics or discuss those topics may not be a super positive thing for those groups of people. I was going to say, I, I also think it, it points to some degree kind of to, to our problems with, with interpreting uh, the positive findings on religion and health then. Right, be, yeah. be, be, because we don't. I guess that was the comparison I was I was trying to, trying to get it. Then you, you know we we wouldn't kind of say that uh, church attendance hurts you know less religious people in the same way we say look people uh, you know we're willing to make that inference that people who attend more you know do better. It's you know, we we wouldn't make it in one case, but we do in the other. But they're kind of conceptually similar. Is is what yeah. I hear you saying? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like, so if you're looking at, uh, I, what, like this hail, this harkens back to some of what I did with my doctoral work, but, uh, what happens when you look at, uh, say like irreligious groups, when they report really low levels of attendance or religiosity, right? Really, really low levels of that. If you compare their average health levels to people who report, uh, religious groups who report very high levels of religion or, or religiosity or attendance, mm -hmm. those two relationships, they, they're about at the same place. And when, in cases where they are, say, statistically different, uh, so, uh, you know, p-value less than 0.05, mm -hmm. the associated effect size with that, uh, so the actual magnitude of difference between the groups is really, really small. And often it's trivially small. So um, the convention for Cohen's D, which is a measure of effect size, not to get too far into those academic weeds at this point, mm -hmm. but anything less than a Cohen's D of like, say, 0.2 is usually seen as trivial. Uh, it's not really something to talk about. And if you're talking about a social activity or uh, the sociocultural perspectives influencing some sort of health outcome, and you're saying it's happening at a level of Cohen's D of less than 0.2, you're talking about something that you probably can't really observe in everyday life and, oh, and the underlying mechanism isn't clear because we're not sure if it's social support driving the majority of this relationship. We're not sure if it's another factor. Um, it's really hard to talk about that and convey a strong sense of meaning to those findings. I mean, it's statistically significant, but that doesn't mean of clinical relevance or of clinical importance. I think, though, one of the examples I, I usually use when I'm teaching students or just talking about significance in general um, is, uh, you know, the, the difference between, uh, I don't want to say, a football player who weighs 200 pounds versus one who weighs 200.1 pounds. Um, you know, one is significantly heavier than the other. Um, but it would be very odd to kind of say, well, uh, you know, the other guy weighs, you know, he weighs significantly more than I do. You know, you know I'm going to, I'm going to have to re rethink the game here, you know, no, yeah. you, you, you know, <laughs> well, especially too with like large population samples, like every, every difference, uh, any difference will become statistically significant, um, with, uh, a, with enough, with enough people sampled. Uh, and the reason is because error term gets progressively smaller with the more people you talk to. So if you have, say, someone has an IQ of 100, someone has an IQ, or one group has an IQ of 100, another one has an IQ of 100.1, right? Mm -hmm. If you sample millions of people and you're able to find uh, that, you know, one mean is 100, the other means 100.1, because you've sampled so many people, what's going to end up happening is that mm -hmm. you it will come out statistically significant, but the associated effect size is so tiny, like why even bother talking about it? And uh, religion, health, religion, uh, research isn't quite there. Uh, there are cases where it's really 
beneficial if you're talking about uh, optimism and outlooks after like say surgery or something like you'll see like higher levels of optimism or you're feeling cared for because you're protected by God. You might see some very specific benefits in very specific cases, but in terms of like a public policy level or like a, on a national health level, mm -hmm. like the differences are often quite small. Not always, but often. Um, kind of wrapping this up and, and bringing this towards the end here, what was interested in, in, in talking a little bit about how uh, re religion and spirituality are, are conceptualized here. Now, now, I know I don't want to beat a dead horse per se, because one of the <laughs> things I think the RSP uh, prides itself on, on doing is, is, is deconstructing and, and exposing uh, uh, underlying structure and assumptions in uh, precisely these kind of terms. Um, but, uh, it, it's something I, I think, well, for public health, uh, professionals do not have extensive, you know, discussion, you know, discussions about discursive practices or, you know, what, what we really mean when we use this word or all the different things we're, we're lumping together. So kind of same with psychologists as well. It's generally left to, um, you know, religious studies scholars and, and humanities. So if, if you could, in, in closing, uh, here kind of bring us into perspective and, and how some of these studies conceptualize religion and spirituality and, and per particularly, um, uh, fr from the, from the vantage point of the non-religious, right? Is it a, is it one of those things where everyone is religious? You just have to find the right, the right. Um, this, uh, I personally, uh, I'm not sure if there's an academic consensus on this specifically. Uh, usually concepts regarding religion tend to be better defined. So if uh, you're looking at, say, church attendance. Better than, often, better defined. Better than, than spirituality. Okay. Better than yeah. spirituality, sorry. That's, that's what I meant. So uh, if you're looking at assessments of attendance, how often do you go to church, right? You, you can get a fairly objective assessment of that. How often do you pray? You can get a fairly objective assessment. It's self-report. You're relying on people to provide you with data. That's okay. Uh, but you can get a fairly objective uh, standpoint. When you're talking about religiosity, you kind of get into what exactly does religiosity mean? Uh, there's different conceptualizations of religiosity. Uh, one that people might be familiar with is intrinsic versus extrinsic. Uh, intrinsic is, uh, in a nutshell, religiosity because you see intrinsic value with religiosity. You, you get something out of it, uh, like on a personal level, uh, where like you see it rewarding or fulfilling in it in itself. Uh, whereas extrinsic religiosity uh, is kind of treating religion as a means to an end, so it's a tool in order to achieve a greater goal. So there's there's kind of some fuzziness around religiosity, but if you ask people how important they feel find religion is to them or how religious do they see themselves, right. you can tend to get a, a more or less consistent set of ways of assessing those specific behaviors I, or beliefs. I, I, I often also think that this gets us into kind of good religion and bad religion, <laughs> particularly from health perspective is people, you know, th there are consistent, you know, some, some negative kind of social effects associated with varieties of, of fundamentalism. And, and, and it seems here that, that, that same health professionals and researchers are, are keen to say, well, when, when we talk about religion, we're not meaning that kind, you know, not, the, <laughs> not, not the stuff that we, that we think is, is, is is bad for, I don't know, you know, public health or, or, or social, you know, cohesion sure. or, well, <laughs> maybe it's not bad. Depends on what <laughs> we mean by social co cohesion here. But, um, I often notice that this gets into a good religion versus bad, you know, the, the, and, and so, and then that makes me think, well, aren't you really just interested in things that are improving health or psychological well-being in general instead of something religious per se yeah um and you can kind of see this uh this is this is more apparent within spirituality literature, literature in my opinion um so if you're looking at say just like pure religion measures like what do you believe uh do you, how often do you go to church are you religious affiliated you get fairly straightforward measures people know what you're talking about uh, people may disagree about whether or not this person's a true member of this religious organization whether or not this person's a true member of that religious organization but there tends to be at least consensus on the idea of how you answer those questions the spirituality literature it like i find is just it's really vague about what that term means and the way spirituality is assessed it may not necessarily uh it may not necessarily be intuitive for 
like the the, the laity. Um, it's just it's very very broad uh, in how it's defined. So often, uh, just I wrote a paper for a skeptic uh, a couple years ago, where I point out that uh, some of the different definitions of spirituality, and one of them defines spirituality as uh, an inherent component of being human and is subjective, intangible, and multidimensional. That literally means anything you want it to mean. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you and I are talking about spirituality. If you say, you know, I'm, you know, uh, you know, my, my aunt's not religious, but she's spiritual. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by I understand what you're trying to convey to me. But if researchers are talking about assessing spirituality, they can't just, oh yeah, I, I, I totally know what you mean. They actually have to quantify and describe and validate measures of spirituality. So when you see these validated measures or these assessments, you see a lot of questions in there that you may not, or at least I wouldn't, and the people I've spoken to wouldn't see these as intrinsically spiritual. So they have questions like, I accept others even when they do things that I think are wrong. Uh, I have a general sense of belonging. Yeah. When, uh, when I wrong someone, I make an effort to apologize. Those things are included as indicators of spirituality. And to me, this is, I mean, this, this is problematic on two different levels. One, if this is in a sense of gaming the system you've chosen or items that are items are being chosen, not because I see an obvious connection with spirituality, they might load together. There might be a statistical reason for including these. That's fine. Uh, these have been validated. I have no issue with that. I'm sure these, uh, I'm positive. These researchers have done the due diligence. This is what's come out. But if you're talking about spirituality with someone, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say like, Oh yeah, well, when I wrong someone, I apologize. That's a spiritual thing. Like, that's a really select definition of spirituality. So if you're finding that how well people are, are engaging socially is an inc intrinsic component of spirituality, and you find that spirituality is related to health, well, yeah, like social support and social being able to mm -hmm. interact socially uh, well with other people is related to support. So just as like a parallel, if you said that, uh, I don't smoke because it's bad for me. And that's a spiritual assessment. And you find that people who score more highly on spirituality get less cancer. Yeah. Well, yeah, you, you've, you've adjusted the parameters of spirituality such right. that it includes not smoking. Well, of course that's related to, of course that's related to uh, cancer rates because it, that's how that works. So it's the thing I find frustrating about the spirituality literature and it's a really interesting literature like people do genuinely good work in it but it's just the variability in what spirituality can mean and the idea that you feel empowered or you feel like you have a purpose in life that spirituality I've, I've never thought of those things as being spiritual before like prior to reading this literature I've always just described that as oh yeah I feel like self like I feel I'm full of autonomy I feel like a sense of mastery but some people connect those with the spiritual concept so when you're connecting those measures of spirituality or that definition mm -hmm. of spirituality with health, I'm not shocked that that's related to better health, sure. but we already knew that from other fields. So my question is kind of if, if spirituality is doing something, what's, what's the unique thing that spirituality is doing? How are you defining that? Is that a good defin, is that a reasonable definition that people would say, Oh yeah, that's definitely spirituality. Or is this a hodgepodge of different areas that we're just kind of lumping together saying spirituality and saying oh look at spirituality better health uh excellent i i was uh was wondering if you had any kind of uh summing up or, or parting phrase or, or, or words thoughts for us on uh, the relationship between religion non-religion and health <laughs> so, um, so, something to send our listeners away with something something even more profound than what you've already said <laughs> I don't know if I could go more profound than okay. what I've said, but uh, like religion is, uh, religion is related to health. Like correlationally, we can establish that religion is related to health. If you're religious and if you go to church, chances are you're probably getting a benefit from it. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter what the underlying mechanism is. If it's the social support angle, is it because you have a sense, a better sense of coherency? Is it because uh, this really uh, makes you feel like spiritually charged as a person? If you're getting a benefit out of it, Continue to, like please continue doing it. Don't be discouraged from not doing it. Um, if you're not religious and you are hearing all these things about oh going to church is associated with better health, 
the more elemental question you have to consider is, will this be good for you specifically? Um, if everyone's, if most people are religious and most people benefit from going to church, fine, but that doesn't incorporate everyone. So there has to be more nuance in the field. Uh, religion is a wonderfully diverse, uh, very complex sociocultural construct. And uh, chances are that its relationship with health is more complicated than a single uh, edict of do more, be healthy. Excellent. Dr. David Speed, thank you for joining us on the Religious Studies Project. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks so much for that, Tommy. Uh, wonderful to hear that discussion. It's always interesting the way um, you know, uh, these topics, um, religion, spirituality, um, atheism, etc., they, they get conflated uh, with notions of health, well-being, public health societal health um they're, they're discursively entangled and we see that entanglement reflected in the research agendas um that tend to get a lot of funding as well so it's good to, to hear um a, a solid introduction to that from Tommy. indeed it's often very uncritical i mean the recent pew survey that's been doing the rounds on twitter for instance saying that this survey shows that religious people are healthier and happier when of course it doesn't it says that when asked they say that they are but that's not the same thing that's the kind of uh it kind of why the critical approach is very important to these uh, uh to these aspects of study because Absolutely. if you're looking if you're looking to see that religion and health are are connected substantively then you will find it if you frame your questions in that way absolutely um talking of the uh, critical study of religion um some big players in that field are on the rsp next week um russell mccutcheon has a new um book or well, recent book uh, called religion in theory and practice demystifying the field for burgeoning academics and we have him um, along with Matt Sheedy and Tara Baldrick Marone, uh, and and in a discussion facilitated by Tenzin Eagle, so we've got um, sort of a, a new podcast recorder and some excellent critical contributions next week. I'm really looking forward to that. Which just reminds me, we have an introduction to Tenzin um, because it's his first time, so we should yes. do that now. Let's have it. Hey, my name is Tenzin Eagle. And I am a lecturer and chair of the MA program at the College of Religious Studies, Mahadol University, Thailand. The College of Religious Studies at Mahadol is one of the few places in all of Southeast Asia dedicated to an academic study of religion, and I'm really proud to be a part of it. I've been here for a couple of years now. I came right after I finished my PhD at the University of Toronto, Canada, where I was born and raised and where I basically focused on continental philosophy. My dissertation was on a French thinker by the name of Jean-Luc Nancy. But during the course of my PhD, I also got really into method and theory and into a lot of the method and theory circles online, uh, such as the Bulletin for the Study of Religion, which I started writing a lot of blogs for, Practicum, as well as a couple that I've written uh, blogs for the Religious Studies Project. All this led me in my personal research on continental philosophy to kind of ask more critical questions uh, about the assumptions that thinkers such as Hegel, Kant, Heidegger, Derrida, etc. have about religion, how they use it, interpret it, imagine it. And that's one thing I enjoy doing in my contemporary uh, research. Another influence on my contemporary research has been the classes I've taught. At the University of Toronto, I taught a bunch of classes on religion and film, and it made very clear to me that there was a certain uh, lack of critical edge in that field. So one of the big things I'm working on right now is an edited volume with Rebecca King, in which we try to bring a more critical approach to that field of study within uh, the academic study of religion. Anyway, that's just a little summary of some of my research stuff. I uh, look forward to creating lots of cool podcasts for the Religious Studies Project that people can uh, use to inform themselves about the ins and outs of our field. Thanks for listening.
And very glad to have Tenzin as part of the team. Um, he's written for Implicit Religion already on uh, critical theory. Um, and uh, it was a very good piece too. Yeah, some excellent responses for the RSP as well. Um, Indeed. So hopefully more interviews from him to come in the future. Talking of interviews to come in the future. Um, oh, we've, we've had just, that one, haven't we? We've, we've done, done that. that. We did that. Yeah, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're ahead of the game. <laughs> wow, that, that's unusual. Well, in which case, um, I think there's only one more thing we do need to say. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for this. Thanks. Thanks. Damn, we didn't get it. Thanks. The RSP is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SC047750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett-Fox and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. Don't forget you can support the project by using our amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com slash projectrs and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals.